Okay. So this is what we're doing. The Death Knight Squire. 5e solo gamebook adventures for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Now, I've already read the primer, but let's do it again. First of all, thank you to Paul Bimler for allowing this stream. And let's get to it. Yes, I got this off the DMs Guild, you can get it there too. A DMless adventure. Okay. Introduction. This is a different kind of module. It is a solo adventure designed for use with the 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons rules. It is designed for a player who cannot find a group with a Dungeon Master, but is dying to play D&D nonetheless. Given the current resurgence of the game, there are quite a few of those players around. Yeah, okay, that's not really interesting, let's get to how we do this. Don't look at the maps until they are specifically directed to you. You will only be spoiling the surprise and gameplay for yourself. I need to lower the volume of the music. Just a bit long more, okay. It's played using two booklets. This one with the instructions and this one with the maps. Uh, you will need to print. No, I don't think so. I'll just draw in it if I want to. Okay, you can do it on roll 20, whatever. You move the token on the tile page. All directions given in the tile page entry. Okay. Find something to function as a PC and monster tokens, game tokens, coins, dice, anything with a bit of weight. If, it's, if an ideal, in an ideal world you'll have miniatures, use them if you have them. I will just do... This is me. Moving around. And everything else will work accordingly. Um, when you're reading entries in the adventure booklet, try to avoid looking at other entries as much as possible. Uh, on a tile page you can move, search for traps, investigate, heal, uh, or any other number of options given. Instructions on the tile page will direct you to certain entries in the adventure booklet. Go to entry, check traps, and so forth. Uh, eventually we'll be directed back to the tile page and from there on to connecting maps. Don't worry too much about learning all that now, it will quickly become clear once you start. Some rules regarding movement only apply to combat. You can move according to your speed for tactical advantage. Otherwise follow directions given. Each square is 5 feet. I need this to be bigger. Also, probably not blue. The hell? What the hell is going on? Properties. Never mind. We'll figure it out. <coughs> um, every square is 5 feet. Monster movement, you will have to move the monster tokens. Unless otherwise stated, all enemies will come at you via the shortest route and attack. Yeah, not a lot of room for tactics here. At the edge of each tile page are numbers and arrows which indicate the tile page connected to the one you're on. When you reach the edge of the tile page, you can move onto the next map as indicated. D100 chance rolls. Uh, sometimes you need to roll chance. Uh, counter will be pertinent to the adventure. It won't be a random encounter. Okay. Yeah, provide some level variety. Green dots and other items on the page. Hang on. Hmm. And you will see an item on a page, like an archway, or a house, or a pile of rocks, and you may move to investigate those. The instructions will be given on the tile page as to how to do that. At other times, you may see a translucent green dot on the page in the, at the intersection of tiles. Sometimes these will contain encounters, good or bad. And other times they will not. 
So you'll never know whether to avoid the Jenny squares or to go through them. Avoiding them might mean you run the chance of missing out on vital clues or items. Or it could mean you'll avoid the mind flare lurking just out of sight. Or it might mean nothing. The dots will sometimes signify nothing at all. Great. Combat. You will play the part of both DM and player. You will need to roll dice, saving throws, and all other appropriate rolls for yourself and any monsters. Uh, you will also roll a die to spawn monsters. Death saves, no death saves. If you're playing with a friend, you should double monster numbers if you're doing this, then death saves are allowed. Extra, extra character can cover you while you're down. If you die, roll up another PC. Spellcasting. Sometimes you'll be asked, like, do you have the spell detect magic? Or you could, uh, playing a mage, think of spells. Uh, spellcasting will mainly be used in combat, and you will choose when to employ it without waiting to be prompted by the text entry, so feel free to cast spells even if the text does not call for it. Use common sense. For example, if you want to cast Featherfall to prevent fall damage, but the option is not given, still go ahead and cast it, avoiding the damage. Even if the options are not given, if you think the spell is appropriate for the situation and all the conditions are met, then go with it. Ask the question, what would the DM do? Also, keep track of your spell slots. Opportunities will be given to rest on certain tile pages. Follow normal rules for resting. If you have healing abilities, use those when you like and as appropriate. Skill checks will be asked for when appropriate. If you are playing a character without dark vision, you will need torches. Let's not do that, shall we? That guy looks menacing. Be honest with yourself about the warning advantage to yourself or your opponents. If you're a ranger with favorite terrain, and you roll for stealth while in the forest, you can award yourself advantage. If you're making an attack for an orc who has stuck you in a net, roll for the orc with advantage. Ask yourself, what would the DM do? Honesty and fairness. In order to give yourself a great, challenging game, the author assumes that you will play honestly and fairly. This means letting the dice fall where they may, keeping track of spell slots, etc. etc. Running monsters through the form. You're really only cheating yourself. If you fail a trap check, obviously you may not try again on that tile page. Your PC does not know you didn't make the roll. Move on with the rest of the tile page instructions. If you are returning to a tile page, use common sense. If you have already checked for traps or have already triggered a trap, you won't fall for it again, will you? Your chance roll is changed as well. In order to, give, to even make a chance roll on the tile page you are returning to, you must roll a d6. 1-5 means your previous passage has been noticed and creatures have moved to other parts of the forest now, and any items there have already been picked up. If you roll a 6, then you may make the chance roll again. Other issues. Always ask, what would a GM do? It should be your guide. Journaling. Write down close information. Uh, the higher the chance you will succeed on this mission. You could also map your progress using graph paper. Why? I have a map. Multiplayer and DM play. Could easily be played with two characters without the DM. They could also run this adventure by reading entries of the players and running the combat on all monsters. Obviously in D&D, classes have special abilities, clerics turn undead, a paladin's divine sense, and so on. Where possible, I have tried to walk those into the story, and you should feel free to bring these into combat and other situations, when called for. If there's undead nearby, the text might read, Are you a paladin? Go to paladin. And then inform you that uh, your divine sense is activated. I've also included many options for spellcasting. Do you have precision Cast an illusion. Uh, create a character of level 2. With gear according to class. Uh, let's say you have 150 GP. Uh, choose between rolling and point buy. I personally prefer point buy as it gives a little more control, but I'm leaving that call up to you. During playtesting, some players found that they completed the quest successfully on the first run. Others took two or three attempts to complete it. It is definitely replayable, but by no means designed to be an easy quest, so feel free to replay it as many times as you want, using different PCs and taking different routes. I'm envisioning this series being sequential and going for a while, so your story will be formed within these adventures. Please do come up with a compelling backstory and background for your characters as well, just because it's fun and helps you to enjoy the adventure. At the end of this, you will progress to level 3. Yay! Ready for the next solo adventure. 
which I'm already in the process of writing. I'm not going to put restrictions on race or class, go with whatever you're feeling, but keep in mind that this adventure is designed to be balanced with PHP plus one characters. In other words, use the player's handbook, blah 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 blah. Uh, do not use Anna Sakana. Oh. Let's get into the adventure. Okay. First of all, we need to create a character. That's what this is for. I'm actually thinking to... Okay, first of all, let's pick standard plane. And the role for abilities in the standard way. Naval dice. Yeah, the rhyme. The rhyme dice. That's a nice set, but let's see what else we can have. Fifteen. Well, there's a 16 and a 14, so that's already pretty good. 15 and 14 also pretty good. And 13. No really bad rolls yet. This is gonna be Mr. Average. <laughs> and 17. And another 17. Okay, this is ridiculous. This is not gonna be fun. Kill it. A 15, 14, and 13, or a 16, 14, and 12? I'll go with this one. No? This one. Yeah. Okay. So I was thinking, since this is a forest adventure, let's go with a ranger. We don't pick the ranger uh, ability yet, the, the subclass. Give me critical role and not magic and non-core. Actually, give me magic the gathering content. And the optional class features and the customized origin feature. Yeah, doing milestones, feats, multi-classing and ignoring and don't ignore coin weight. Randomize. Let's pick race first. Custom lineage. Humanoid, small or medium. One ability score increased by two. One feat of your choice, variable trait. Actually, we should have the new uh, li li um, lineages. I want to try those. Um, I should have that. Ah, I disabled playtest content. Let's let's do playtest content. Dampier. Perry. Let's go with Ferry. Not available for this character. Okay, Ranger needs... Actually, let's do three skulls. Let's do Dex, Wiz, and Constitution. Language, common one other lang language. How about Sylvan? Because fairies. You are Fae. Fairy Flight and can hover. Fairy Magic. Wisdom. Fairy Fire and Druidcraft. And I can squeeze through tight spaces. Yeah, I know he said no one after Kana. I want to. Hang on. Boy. Boy. Alma. Boy. My dog doesn't want to show us off. Okay. 
Hit points 1d10, first of all, second level ranger. Proficiencies, we're going strictly forest. So let's go with stealth and survival. And investigation? Probably need investigation. Favored enemy. Let's look at this. Theft Explorer replaces Natural Explorer, which gives me double proficiency. Wait. Natural Explorer means all kinds of moving along things, which are kind of ridiculous, actually. So let's switch that out with Theft Explorer. Uh, so you gain the canny benefit, choose one of your skill proficiencies, it is doubled. Also speak, read and write two additional languages. So let's go with, um, I can't pick Druidic. Mm. Uh, how about Goblin? And... Halfling? Giant? Elvish? Let's go with Elvish. And... Double investigation, because we're going to be pretty good at the other things. Favored enemy. Favored enemy says you pick an enemy type, and you learn the language of your choice, an advantage on tracking or recalling information about them, which is also not very interesting. Favor the foe, however, when you hit a creature with an attack roll, you can call on your mystical bond uh, to target your favorite enemy for one minute. First time I hit that creature, I deal damage. You can increase damage by 1d4. And mark a favorite enemy a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus on a long rest. Let's do that. And the fighting style, archery, druidic warrior, gives me two cantrips of my choice. Own two weapon, two weapon, or oh, blind fighting. Hmm, blind fighting. If I pick Druidic Warrior, I can do things like Thorn Whip and Primal Savagery, which is neat. And I can also do Control Flames or Produce Flame, and you can throw flames at things. Now I'm going to stick with Thorn Whip and Primal Savagery, I think. 1d10 acid damage. Make a melee attack. Yeah, that, that's the problem. It doesn't synergize with extra attack. So let's go with Guidance. Yeah, let's go with Guidance. It will help me the other stuff. What kind of spells do we take for the ranger? Two first level spells. Let's go with detect magic. And beast bond. Hoglar, Goodberry, Hunter's Mark. Zephyr Strike? Move like the wind, do not provoke attacks of opportunity for one minute. And advantage on one attack roll, an extra 1d8 force damage. But those full actions, which ones? And why don't I have my chat over here? Give me a second to find my chat.
There's my chat. Put my chat over here. The cantrips. Um, yeah, both of those are actions. That's the that's what I'm worried about. <clears throat> Which means they don't synergize with extra attack once we get there, if we get there. But I do want some... Ranger usually has better things to do than put this flame. Yes. Yeah, probably. So I'm going with Thorn Whip, which I also consider kind of utility, and Guidance, which will help me with investigating around. But I also think I should probably have some healing. So let's screw Hunter's Mark for the minute and go with Goodberry. Or Cure Wounds. Goodberry is more stable, but I'm not playing with anyone else. I'm playing with myself. I'm playing with myself. Uh, so probably this will be more useful. Okay. I have 16 hit points. Okay. Now let's assign abilities. This goes in dexterity. This goes in wisdom. This goes in con. This goes in intelligence. This is strength and this is charisma. And now in my class, yeah, dexterity, wisdom, constitution, not constitution, actually not wisdom, intelligence. That way I have 16, 14, 12, 14, and I should be good enough with investigating things too. Description. What kind of background? If we're talking about a fake creature, then maybe Far Traveler? Gives me insight, perception, musical instrument, and language. Hmm. I think I'll lower the music a bit more. Yeah, don't want any more distractions. Fall Traveler is an option. Faceless. Faceless is cool. No, I don't want to go that route. Um, haunted one. Knight. Outlander. Outlander is nice for, for rangers. Athletics. You can also choose another skill. Because I probably picked one, that one already. Pirate. Outlander gives me athletics and something else. Far Traveler gives me insight and perception, which is good because they're wisdom based. We can also go with a folk hero. Gives me animal handling and one more thing. And vehicles. And artisan tool. I think I'm still leaning far, more towards Far Traveler. Gaming set. In the language. Let's go with gaming set and dice. In the language, Minotaur, Primordial. Primordial would be useful. We're talking elementals. Giant. Let's stick with Primordial. All eyes on me. Okay. Character details. Alignment. Lawful neutral. Neutral good. Lifestyle. Modest. Characteristics. I'll think about it. Random. I have my own ideas about what is and is not food, and I find the eating habits of those around me fascinating, confusing, and revolting. Sure. That's the same one. Sarcasm and insults are weapons of choice. Hmm, not working for me. Focus on of honor or sense of proprietary, propriety that others don't comprehend. Sure. Ideals. 
cunning. That's evil. That's evil. Any. Sure. Bonds. My freedom is my most precious possession. I'll never let anyone take it from me again. Okay, seems to be really into it. So let's do that. Laws. I pretend not to understand the local language in order to avoid interactions I would rather not have. That sounds like me. Uh, look into that later. Next is equipment. <coughs> Or gold. 5d4 times 10. You know what? 5d4, the average for that is 10, 12 and a half. So that's a really good roll. Yeah, that's a really good roll. Let's add the starting gold. Let's add the gold that was already given, which adds up to 330. And let's talk about what we're buying. First thing we need is our studded leather. Studded leather. Costs 45. That puts me down to 285. Next thing we need is some weapon. As we know, this is light armor, medium armor, shield, simple weapon, martial weapon. And with fighting style, I went Druidic Warrior. Let's lean into ranged weapons, I think. A long bow. Is quite expensive, but I can handle it. <laughs> a long ship? No, I don't need a long ship. Or maybe crossbow? Crossbow heavy. Same cost, much more damage, and I'm not going to do extra attacks anytime soon. So let's, or maybe short sword and and uh, and crossbow, crossbow. It is range light and loading, so I can use uh, and crossbow and a short sword at the same time. Let's do that. That'll be fun. And crossbow. And short sword. Moon touch sword, no. So that's another 10. 85 brings me down to 200. What else do we need? Stick to not magical, common everything. An axe beak. An axe beak is a piece of gear. Let's get a backpack or two. Oopsie. Shut up. One ninety eight. So, in that backpack, we need a bedroll. There's another one. And we probably need some bolts for that crossbow. Let's take bolts. One 20 bundle size. So give me two of those. For another 2 GP. And I think a mess kit is in order. 
or point two to silver. So I'll bring that down by one and silver up by eight. What else does a young adventurer need? Bedroll, bell, blanket, blasting powder. Boots. Right, clothes. Clothes. Traveler's clothes. 2GP. Non magical other gear. Bullets, burglar's back. Yeah, what if we just pick an explorer's back? Contains backpack, bedroll, mesquite, tinderbox, 10 torches, 10 days rations, and a water skin. And 50 hemp, 50 foot of hemp rope. So let's add that. Drop one mesquite. And one bedroll. And one backpack. That should be good. What else do we have that's expensive? Uh... Shield? Do I need a shield? I don't think I need a shield. Let's grab a potion of healing. I even want two. Armor? Non magical? Yeah, stud leather keeps my speed up. Any potions? Watchful rest. It has no price. Everything else is magical. Uh, boomerang, boomerang? Nah. Short sword, light hand crossbow. I'm good. Double blade of scimitar. Let's not go there. A whip, maybe? No, I got the thorn whip. Um, wondrous items, other gear. Got rope. I don't really need the torches, I can dump the torches. Wait, I didn't actually pick someone with dark vision. Crowbar might be useful. Add a crowbar, that's two. Remember, remember. Two GP. Dream Lily. Dragon Shard. An elephant. Loot. Dice set. Two GP, one silver. Grappling hook. Four GP, one silver. Grenade. <laughs> Healer's kit? No. Herbalism kit? Holy water? Insect repellent. That could be useful actually. That's uh, one silver piece for eight hours, or one GP for twenty uses for twenty days. Kai Iron Child. Manacles, manacles are nice. Six GP, one silver. A mastiff. 
a move bound though. Oil, oil is useful. Six GP five silver. Kittens? I don't think we need it. A ten foot pole. A robot. Thieves tools. Yeah, I don't have proficiency anyway. <clears throat> I think that's it. So, 6 GP, 5 silver. And... Phase do not get tucked in. Mm -hmm. I want someone with dark vision. Changelings don't have dark vision? No. Custom lineage then. Let's see. Creature type, humanoid, size, medium, ability score. I want to switch it up. Fine, wisdom. Feet of my choice. Wait, 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 wait. Really? A viable trait? Dark vision or proficiency? And languages. So I get a plus two to an ability score and a feat. Hmm, I don't like it. Let's go with Elf, Dampir. Dampir has Dark Vision, and Spider Climb, and Bite. <laughs> sure, let's go Dampir. Uh, increase Dexterity, increase Wisdom. Languages, Primordial. Sylvan, I am a humanoid and an undead. And Medium, Dark Vision. Spider climb. And vampiric bite. I can empower my bite equal to my proficiency bonus, which is going to be two. Okay. My abilities are now 16, 13. 11, 16. <clears throat> My other option was the two twelve instead of 13 and 11. Let's keep the 13 and 11. Okay. Dump the torches. Yeah, they're worth together one silver piece. And dump the hempen rope for one GP. And buy a better rope.
Bill Group. Which is 10 GP. You know what? Bring two more potions of healing. Because I have the money for it. Okay, that's the character. Armor class is 15. Okay, cool. Level 4, when you hit a creature, yeah, you can mark it. Okay, that's the character. Backstory, arrival in Orlbar. It is the year 1349 DR in the months of deep winter. You have been on the road for nearly two months now and snow hangs thick on the trees as you make your way towards the town of Orlbar, at the foot of the Grey Peak Mountains. The Grey Peaks are known throughout the Faerun for their silver and iron mines, but it is a different type of metal that brought you here. Gold. While you were in Neverwinter, you overheard rumors of a large hoard of treasure within an abandoned goblin keep. Even tavern rumors proved to be fruitful sometimes, and having been without purpose for some months, you departed immediately for the Grey Vale. When you reach Olbar, the air is brisk and town is busy. Carts carry all manner of goods, timber, wool bales, grain and animals from the surrounding country. Some of these goods would be bound for Waterdeep or Neverwinter, others for the nearby city of Loudwater. Hungry and thirsty after many days on the road, you enter the first tavern you see, but I have rations. The woodsmen retreat and satisfy your cravings. Bread, cheese and hot mulled wine do the trick nicely. You then inquire from the barkeep about accommodation. Your bones ache and rest is essential. The mountains can wait one or two days while you rest and replenish your supplies in town. The barkeep tells you that a very respectable inn, the Silver Flask, is just nearby. Uh, toting your a backpack, you walk down the street to the Silver Flask and pay for a room. The innkeep is Jolly Woman who is glad to have your business. And she lights a cozy fire in your room. You bathe, then lie down to rest and soon fall into a deep sleep. It's been a while since your travel hardened self has had clean sheets and a roof overhead. You are woken later that night by noise from the next room. You can hear a woman openly sobbing on the other side of the wall. The sound is gut wrenching. Every now and then, a male voice says something, as if trying to comfort her. You tolerate this for a while, but eventually it becomes evident that sleep is going to be impossible, and you walk out into the hallway and knock on the door to the room next to yours. An elderly man answers. He is dressed finely, like a member of the aristocracy, but sports a nasty black eye and a gash across his cheek. In the background, a woman, also richly dressed, sits on a chair by the fire, her face buried in her hands. Yes, what is it? The elderly gentleman asks directly. You straighten yourself up, peering into the room. I was wondering what all the noise was about, you say, although now you don't feel quite so annoyed. I could hear the crying from next door. I was wondering. You say gruffly, not used to dealing with arist aristocrats. <clears throat> if it's anything I can help with, perhaps then we can all get some rest. At this, the woman looks up and sees you. You probably look a fright after all those weeks on the road. Ungroomed, hair disheveled, probably pale as hell, travel worn clothes, but you've had a bath so you at least you don't smell bad. Wait for it. However, your type has an air about them. You've seen a fight or two and know how to handle yourself in most situations. You're what's known in these parts as the adventuring type. Such types generally know how to get things done, things that others might shy away from. Show our guest in, Elric. The woman says weakly, drying her tears with a silk handkerchief. Elric. Not the Elric, right? Hang on a minute.
Uh, setting a reminder for tomorrow it's sometime that's normal. <coughs> Okay. The Mysterious Knight. You are shown to a chair. For some reason, this old couple who introduced themselves as Lord and Lady Bremont. Elric Bremont? That wasn't his name, right? No, no. Wait. What's this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. They welcome your presence, if only as a distraction from the grief they seem consumed by. We arrived here last night, Lady Bremont begins. Elric is so busy these days, so we thought he would we would bring ourselves out to Olvar for a little holiday. Our son, he's so fond of the mountains, loves all the stories. Well, he's our grandson, really. The son of our daughter, who died some years ago. <coughs> he is all we have left of her. We call him our son. Lady Bremont begins sobbing once more. Elric Bremont picks up the thread. Long story short, my friend, we were accosted on the highway. We were passing along a lonely stretch of road when, we, when he appeared. From nowhere, a knight, a towering brute of a man, all clad in armor. Lord Elric points to his face. He did this to me, knocked me out cold. Then he grabbed our boy, threw him on the horse, and bolted. Without a word. Hmm, you say, mulling over this information. Did he seem familiar, this knight? Elric shakes his head. I don't know what you're thinking. A wealthy aristocrat on the holiday from Loudwater, someone must have known we were coming out here and seized the opportunity. It's true, I am what you would call a public figure. It is well known, in Loudwater at least, that I am a wealthy man, but no, this night was something else. We didn't see his face, it was hidden by a great metal visor. A towering warrior he was, a hulk of a man. Lady Bromon speaks again. And he has kidnapped our poor little duck! Abducted him, just slipped him out of our grasps. Incompetent fools. What did you do then? You ask. We came straight to Olbau, Lady Bowman says. We went to the captain of the guard, but he. he. Thoroughly incompetent fool, Lord Bremont growls. Said this knight was a ghost, that he'd chosen Derek as, as his squire, and that there was nothing we could do about it. But Derek wasn't the first. I called him the Death Knight. You can imagine what a comfort that was to us. They say the knight lives in the woods nearby, Lady Bremon says early, as if in a waking dream. What a cut wood, isn't it, dear? I know what a cut wood. The old man grits his teeth, staring into the fire, and punches his palm. Ghost my ass, he snarls through gritted teeth. That knight looks real enough to me. He's a lunatic, nothing more. A lunatic who kidnaps young boys. And when I find the blackguard, by the gods will he pay. You can't help thinking that Lord Bremont is a bit out of his depth here. You don't doubt his resolve, but he looks as though his days of conquest are well behind him. You feel for this poor old couple, while not usually associating with the, with the wealthy, you do know that you have something to offer them. And you'll never want to shy away from a good adventure, especially when the chance of a reward is on the table. I can find you, boy, you hear yourself saying. The woman looks up, and new hope begins to shine from her eyes. Oh gods, he sa she says, her voice quivering. We'll give you anything, anything. The old man is a little more practical. If I was a few decades younger, I'd be out there myself. Saw action in the Battle of Tanglefork when we freed the veil from Rensha rule. He nodded appreciatively. That battle happened about 30 years ago and was said to be fierce. You are not surprised. Eric Bremont definitely carried himself like an old veteran. I can't put my soul forward anymore, but I can offer you gold, my friend. 2,000 pieces of it, to be exact. Ooh. The adventure begins. At dawn the next day, following a few scraps of information you have, you saddle your horse and ride to the outskirts of town. The townsfolk pay you little mind as you go, casting you the occasional glance. The journey to Weathercott Wood lies due east, so there's no short ride. The captain of the guard tells you that the Death Knight has always been seen in a small patch of wood that juts out from the western side of Weathercott like a wart on a giant's nose. By midday, you reach a sign which tells you you have another 15 miles to go. You should make it there by nightfall. Not far past the sign is a small inn and tavern. An old man sits on a chair in an afternoon sun and raises a tankard of ale as you pass. 
Tavern. Last drink for many miles, the old man calls to you. Come, sit, I'll buy you an ale. Hint, hover over the choices and click to navigate to your section. Ooh, connectivity. Sure, I can start for a brewski. You tie your horse, your horse up to the tavern's porch and join the old man, who directs a young boy to bring you a frothing tankard of ale. The boy also brings a bowl of stew for you to eat. What brings you out this way? The old man asks eventually. Do you tell him of your quest? Or if you choose to simply replenish yourself and be on your way? Sure, let's talk about the death knight. You find yourself telling the old man all about your quest to find a mysterious knight and return Dark Bruman to his grandparents. The old man nods solemnly. The death knight, he says quietly, and leans forward in his chair. Local legend, they say, but uh... What? What? He straightens up, looking you straight in the eye. It's no legend, he says firmly. There was a boy when they hung him from the red tree in the watercut wood. Are you? Are you? Coming to the tree. <laughs> The old man goes on to tell you the story. The man who would become the Death Knight was once a good man who came from a village in the far south. After his wife died from the pox, he left his village taking his only son with him as his squire. He got to teach him the ways of the righteous warrior. But a large band of brigands ambushed them on the road, shot the knight with a poisoned dart, kidnapped his son. They left a note pinned in the ground with a dagger. Demanding the knight plunder the treasury in Olbar and deliver the gold to them. The knight did so, almost dying in the process. But the town guard pursued him from town. When the kidnappers saw the knight coming with the authorities close behind, they killed the poor boy and fled. Upon finding his son's body, the knight swore vengeance on the bandits and vowed to pursue them unto the ends of the world. Unwilling to be taken by the town guard, the knight drew his weapon to resist the arrest. The ensuing fight was bloody, but the knight slew all who came against him. When the fight was over, the knight pursued the bandits deeper into the wood, but lost their tracks in the undergrowth. His rage deepened until the bloodlust and madness possessed him entirely. Driven insane at the thought of his son's killers escaping unpunished, none would cross his path and live until the bandits had been brought to justice at the tip of his blade. Eventually, more soldiers had to come from Loudwater to capture the insane knight. When they finally did, the old man concludes, they hung him in what they wood from a red tree. The old man looks down. But his unfulfilled quest to find his son's killers brought him back as undead. The Death Knight, they call him now. Since then, in a few years or so, a boy will go missing. He's looking for a squire, someone to help him on his quest. You take a moment to digest all this information and drink from your tankard. After a while, you thank the old man for the company and the information and are on your way. It is late when you finally reach Weathercott Wood, some 55 miles east of Olbar. There, on the wood's edge, you camp and let your horse run free. You won't be needing him for a while. Weathercott Wood is thick, the foliage dense, towering walls of green. And in there, somewhere, if the information you have is to be trusted, is the boy, Derek Brumont. You settle down in your bedroll, the embers of your fire keeping you warm well into the night. After a full day's riding, it doesn't take long for you to fall into a deep slumber, the sound of a nearby river lulling you to sleep. You wake just before dawn, fully rested, but a noise instantly puts you on guard. From somewhere nearby comes a wet, slavering sound. Quietly you pick up your weapon and move forward stealthily. When you're some hundreds or so feet away, whatever is lurking catches your scent, and you hear it running quickly away. Only dim starlight shows any detail and all you can see is darkened shapes moving through the night, towards the wood. Do you have a ranged weapon? Go to shoot after. Not go to dead Nelly. Sure, let's shoot it. The target is about 100 feet away. You lift your weapon, taking a quick assessment of the conditions. Make a ranged attack roll at disadvantage, unless you have dark vision. AC 17 is whatever is fleeting from you. Your attack hits, go to good shots. Okay, ranged attack at 100 feet away. That's still a disadvantage because of the distance. That's an 8. 
Plus 5 is 13. No way that hits. You watch the black shape scurry away back into the cover of watercart food and curse your poor aim. Hey, it was a hundred feet away! Then you walk forward to where the creature had been before you startled it and sent it running for the trees. Go to entry dead nearly. You walk forward to where the beast had been before making all that noise that woke you. There, twitching in its death throes, is the horse you rode from Orba. Cutting your teeth in anger, you take out your weapon and quickly put the poor beast out of, mis out of its misery. The first rays of dawn begin to creep into the sky. With a sigh of resignation, you wipe the horse's blood from your weapon and begin the trek towards the woods' edge. The morning is peaceful, in contrast to the savagery you have just witnessed, and a chorus of birds greet the dawn with calls. Go away. Uh, take off the low hills of the surrounding landscape. As you near Weathercut Wood, and, and you can see... Down the single path that leads into its depths, you see that little light seems to penetrate in through the canopy. Night still hides beneath the mossy boughs and dark green vines that thread the ancient tree together. You step into the path and enter Watercard Wood. Who knows what fate awaits you within these shadow depths? Go to tile page 1. Click this link to go to the, to the entry. Tile page 1. I'm guessing we're starting over here. I didn't actually name my my dump here. Uh, go back to edit. <coughs> Edris, no. Lesnis, Ilk Salim, Emnik. Lynn, Johannes, Malachus, I didn't have, Omakan, Paulus, Arius, Brilgi, Kidur, Hermina, Nadethas, just off in the goddamn fantasy name generator. Fantasy name. Uh, no Dampier names? Death names? Try again. No. Uh, Anansi names. <coughs> Zombie types. Drowner, hurler, screaker, pouncer, <laughs> brute, wacko. Okay. Night names. Kalman. Humpty. Try again. Bob. Bardolf. Let's go with Reynard. The Harbinger. Sure. Okay. Tile page one. Give me an R. But make it 48 and white. R. Okay. Find tile page 1 in the mass reflect. Move your token into a bottom grid space square of the tile page or place your token on a square adjacent to the tile you have just come from. You move ahead deeper into the wood and it almost seems as if the trees themselves are watching your progress. Indeed, as you go on, you really do get the feeling you're being watched. You can move with stealth, make a stealth check, DC 12. Okay, I need you to just stop right now. And I need dice to be on. Can you just not right now? 
Okay. Stealth. That's a seven. You may add ten points to any d10 chance roll you make while on this page. You can check for traps. Roll perception. DC 12. That's better. Go to check success. Go to trap fail. When you already move your token through the map in the direction you desire. When you reach a square joining the green translucent dot, go to quiet entry. When you have finished all encounters, you may move to the edge of the map and onto adjoining tile pages. Okay, let's check success. You see nothing. Do any, any traps are set here. Return to tile page 1 and continue from the last direction you read. Um, okay, let's go to quiet entry. You pause for a second, thinking you heard something. But no, it was just some bird flapping out of, co out of cover. You watch it rise into the canopy and then look around at the three paths that lead off from here. Return to top page one and choose which way you go to. Hmm. I think I'm gonna go with... with three. Copy this. Thank you. Oui. Find tile page 3 in the maps booklet. <clears throat> the track leads deeper into the wood and the light fades. Ancient trees line each side of the path and you can't help but think this wood is an excellent place to hide out. Then, ahead, you see something strange. It appears to be a low stone building. At the corner of the track, where it turns north. Tucked in amongst the trees, it is made solidly of grey stone, fronted by two large stone double doors. You move warily forward. Moving with stealth, you make a stealth check. Of course I'm moving with stealth. Oh my god. Yeah, I'll take note. Check for traps. Let's go top check. You move forward. The last as you investigate the surroundings. To check for traps, go to in surrounding forest to approach and check for traps on the double stone doors. Go to door check. Door check. Door check. Move your token up to the stone building if not already. Mm. You start inspecting the handle and all around the door looking for booby traps or traps of any description. Roll perception. Not 20! Wow. Entrance trap. Your keen eye could have just saved your life. Closely inspecting the door, you notice a catch mechanism cleverly hidden under the large metal ring handle on the right door. If you want to try and disarm it, you will need thieves tools to do so. If you want to attempt this, go to Nimble Fingers. If you don't have thieves tools but want to try and open the door anyways, go to Open Stone Door. If you'd rather leave it and continue north, return to Tile Page 3 and continue from the last section you read. It's probably gonna explode on me. There's a hidden catch, come on! I'll, I'll get back to it. Uh, let's investigate the stone doors. You walk up to the building watching your periphery. It is a low, rounded building, surrounded by large stone double doors, which look heavy, but could probably be moved by a good pull or push. The metal ring sits halfway up the inner edge of the right-hand door. Surrounded by ornate designs, you look closer, it is a mosaic of sun designs. Make a history check if you wish, DC 10. I'm in. 
study design. A close study of the sun designs reveals the obvious. They are images of Amantur, the sun god, the most worshipped god in the realm. Is that our? Okay. This is probably a temple of some sort. You want to check for traps, or you could try pushing on the door. You could leave and not continue north. Return to tile page 3. But I want the stone doors. Door check, open stone doors. Got it. <coughs> if you would rather keep going, then your character continues around the bend in north. When you reach a square joining the green marker, go to round the twist. Okay. When you finish on colors, you may move to the edge of the map and onto adjoining tile page. Make a D100 roll. Add 10 to it if you made a successful stealth check earlier. Nope. Okay. One D100, please. 94. Wow. Go to Garb. Make your way quietly up the path, keeping an eye out for enemies. To your right, something catches your eye, something moving in the trees. You freeze, hand on your weapon, and look closer, squinting through the dense undergrowth. It appears to be a cloak hanging from a branch and moving slightly in the breeze. It is a deep green, forest green, easily missed. Inspect the cloak! You make your way off the path slightly, find for any movement, and walk slowly up to the cloak. Pulling it down off the branch, you turn it over in your hands, inspecting the workmanship. It looks like it belonged to someone about your size, and you place it over your shoulders to try it out. You feel a change come over you. Instantly, you feel more secure, more hidden even. You have a feeling this cloak could come in handy. And a cloak of protection! Yay! Protection! Equipped. That tune. Nice. Well, find. Please, with your new position, you rejoin the path and continue on your way. Yeah, that was probably the best find, right? I just want to see what shrub is. Uh, shrub. Red star berries. Healing items. Okay. Uh, go to map 4. Tile page 4. Yup, yup, yup. Moss. Another green thing. The woods become ever deeper and the sound goes out of the air. There are no birds here. Or something has frightened them into silence. It is hard even to tell what time of day it is this deep in the forest. Across the path you see a trail of bootprints leading from the right to the left. Really? They lead back into the forest where it becomes very dense. However, there is no sign of the foliage being disturbed even though the bootprints look relatively fresh. They could have been made as recently as last night. On the track ahead you can see that this path eventually bends to the right. And on the corner, there appears to be an entrance to a cave. Moving with stealth, make a stealth check. Yes, that's a 20. Checking for traps. Deep woods. To investigate the mossy log to the left, go to mossy log. Let's go with Mossy Log. You walk up to the moss-covered log, and as you near it, you see that it is covered with fungi. Fungi? Bright green mushrooms. You are not sure if you have seen that kind before. The color almost seems phosphorescent, like they would glow even at night. Make a survival, survival check. That's 14. If you succeed, go to Funky Fungi. 
Suddenly it comes to you. Yes, you started to similar, seem similar. These are Grax spores, and they are well known to warriors, em emboldening them before going into battle. Overjoyed at this find, you begin gathering the fungi into a small <laughs> pouch. Watercart wood is certainly full of surprises. Grax spores will grant immunity to the frightened condition or any fear effect at full effectiveness for one hour. They can effectively be used for one encounter and can be consumed as a free action, after which they take effect immediately. Add them to your inventory. Wee okay, let me mark it. Let's add a custom item. What do I add a custom item? Custom item. Grexpos. We're going to be nah, 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 nah. okay. Give me all of that just in case. Return to page four. Let's check for traps, I guess. You edge forward warily, checking the ground and trees above for traps. Who knows what deadly plans the inhabitants of this wood have in store for hapless travelers. Make a perception check. Nope. Ambush? Suddenly something gives way under your feet. You fall about 10 feet, landing heavily in a deep pit. It wins you, and you get your feet shakily. Cursing your carelessness, take 1d6 fall damage. One. Sure. Uh, looking around, you decide that you had better get out of this pit trap as quickly as possible before whoever dug it returns. Do you have a rope? Yes. Do you know jump? No. Are you very tiffling? Some kind of form of flying. No, I gave that up. But I can find a climb. I think spider climb is close to flying. What is rope escape? You fashion a lasso at the end of a rope, I... Well, what now? Uh, where was I? No. Um, tile page 4. I checked for traps. I fell in the trap, I fly away. I don't hover, but I just climb out of the pit. Uh, and I came to rest on the side of the pit. Looking ahead, you focus back on your quest and resume your progress. Resume progress. Uh, who knows what? Did you make an earlier trap check on this tile page? If you did, continue reading below. If you did not, go to Andre Oops. As you progress deeper into Watercourt Wood, you realize that you are very tired. Time has a mind of its own in this forest. It is evening already. How have the hours passed so quickly? Am I looking at the right thing? Yeah, I am. The idea of rest enters your mind, although you know that the area you are in is less than ideal for making camp. You may be disturbed by some wandering creature. There's no way of telling. You may attempt to rest here and recover HD. Just do so all survival. If you succeed, nice camp. If you fail, night critters would rather continue without rest. Return to tile page 4. And continue. Okay, guess we're going to 7.
Do, 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 do. Seven, seven. Seven. Uh, okay. A river threads through this part of Weathercourt Wood. Ahead, you see the path bends sharply to the right, and on the north side of the path sits a rock outcropping, on the front of which is the entrance to a cave. Peering inside from across the river, you see that it, is ex it extends a long way. Exploring this cave is going to require you to cross a stream. Also, a busy torrent, about 15 feet wide, rushes from east to west. Filling the forest with the sound of rushing water. Doesn't look that difficult. Moving with stealth, make a stealth check. Of course, I'm moving with stealth. That was a nine. Okay, it was like a two. Checking for traps. Yeah, after that pitfall, yeah, I'm checking for traps, everything. Make a perception check. 16. Go to hidden danger. You give the place a thorough visual search. You see nothing that looks suspicious. Return to page 7. Move your tokens through the map in the direction you desire. To approach and investigate the stream, go to cave stream. Let's do river dwellers first. Yep. Make a d100 roll. Spatter, Mikadus, or pin drop. Ninety-five! <laughs> Pin drop. You are on alert, but only the sound of the river and the birds and trees provide any noise and movement in this part of the wood. Return to Talpage 7. Go to Cave Stream. You peer into the black cave entrance that caves at you from the other side of the river. The area around the entrance is interesting. It appears to be surrounded with discarded pottery and other detritus. Perhaps there was a settlement here once. Tribal societies once roamed this area freely in prehistory. Now the cave appears abandoned and its back mouth forbidding. The stream appears calm, but a glance at its depths tells you it is moving quite swiftly. It might take a bit of effort to cross. You may take this opportunity to refill your water skin if need be. Are you a paladin? Nope. You attempt to wade across. Make an athletics check. Stream cost or swept down? DC 12 athletics check. The odds are not in my favor. Let's try something else. Eight. It feels as if you have been in this wood for an age. Now the dim light of evening has fallen and darkness creeps back under the boughs of weathercut wood. You have reached a four-way junction. You scout around and just off the path find several places that will be suitable for making camp. Your bones ache after a long day and your stomach rumbles. What spell did I pick? Guidance and Tone Whip. I should just use Guidance on everything. Why didn't I do that? That's what I should do. Guidance on everything. Uh, moving with Stealth. DC 10. So give me stealth plus a d4. That's 23 plus a d4. That's 27. Checking for traps. Go to junction traps. Oh, 
All Perception DC 9. That's an 8. That's a 12. Go to safe houses. You do a thorough visual search of the area and find no traps. Safe as houses. Go back to 8. Move your token through the map in the direction you desire. If you'd like to investigate the hole in the ground... Excuse me? Hole in the ground. I think I'm gonna go over here. And when you reach the tile, green dot, to likely camp. You can see two potential camp areas. Yep. Uh, one in the northwest corner of the junction, one in the northeast corner. You feel absolutely dog tired in your bones and know that if you don't rest now, the rest of your mission could become increasingly difficult. You need to make camp and try to get some much earned rest. Northeast camp or northwest camp? What do you think? Kind of partial to this one. Because it's out of the way of the hole. Any thoughts? Maybe I should lower my dream delay. Now, oh well. let's pick the northeast corner. To the northeast is a large hollow tree trunk. You unfurl your bedroll inside it. Take this opportunity to eat provisions. If you cannot, you should be able to last another day without feeling the effects of exhaustion. Now I have rations. Let's eat some rations. You lie down and quickly fall asleep to the gentle sound of wind whispering through the canopy. Night night! You wake in the early hours of the morning feeling very refreshed. Recover one hit die. Long rest. You make your way back out of the pathway and consider which path to take. Let's investigate the hole! Tucked back into the trees, you see a large elongated hole in the ground, like a gash, as if some huge beast has literally ripped the earth asunder. You edge forward and peer down. Who knows what lurks down there? Part of you is screaming to back away, but your adventuring self always wants to know what's around the next corner. Holes in the ground are your stock in trade. To lower yourself down in this black chasm, go to footholds to ignore this. No, I can climb down. Let's climb down. You carefully climb down. There is a drop, about 15 feet or so, but you use several rocky crags to make the descent a bit easier. Reaching the bottom, you see a passage of sorts, more a kind of winding burrow, extending ahead. You begin to make your way slowly down it. Outside it was nearing evening, and thus inside here it grows dark. But ahead you see a source of light. First of all, it's morning. To head towards this light source, go to entry to the light. To leave this place and climb back up, return to cloud page 8. Crossword, onwards! Slowly and deliberately, you edge forward, rounding a corner. It appears you are in an old mine of some sort. There is mining equipment here and there, and there, but it is worn, rusted, unused for a long time. However, ahead, fire burns in a brazier, suggesting this place has been recently inhabited. The brazier throws warmth and light throughout this small cavern. You search further around the walls and find a small recess, which contains a number of interesting items. Very interesting items. There is a chest, securely locked, Duly locked, a small stack of scrolls and books, and a nondescript pile of all sorts of items. Silver goblets, scattered semi-valuable jewelry, paintings, leans against the wall. A quick leaf through the scrolls, searching for more information, reveals maps of this area, scrolled over with all sorts of markings, many of which you don't understand. Then it all clicks into place. You have stumbled onto the thieves' end! 
You feel a sudden mix of elation at finding all this loot and apprehension of being caught. Are you a rogue? No. I can't read can't. Uh, try opening the chest. Going through the books and scrolls. Or leave. As leave cave is a section of itself, probably uh, some encounter. So let's try and open the chest. Uh, simply open it, you will need thieves tools. You don't have thieves tools, but I can still try and open it. Oof. Next time I bring thieves tools. Uh, check for traps. Make a perception roll DC 17. How is... Oops. 8. Plus... Oh, 12. Yeah, no. You make what you think is a pretty thorough search, but cannot find any kind of booby trap on the chest. If you want to try and open the chest, go to pick lock. Otherwise, go to go to the lights. Go to all the lights. Pick lock. You walk with your thieves' tools, trying to open the chest and get the riches within. You hear a tiniest, faintest click. Go to vapor. Without warning, a blast of purple vapor hits you square in the face. Uh. Make a constitution save DC 18. Oh my god, that's terrible. Nope. Cast. Roll 1d4 and take that much poison damage. 3. Uh, I don't have any resistances, right? No. Uh, oh well. Ah, no, I don't die. Uh, continue reading. You don't remember anything after the gas hits you in the face. You wake up, still within the mine, but your head is pounding, and you find you are bound hand and foot. <laughs> your mouth is gagged also. As your vision clears, you see that you are surrounded by three figures, all human. Gradually, your sight improves a little more, and you can see that they are all what you would call the adventuring type. Probably rogues. The first one, an older man, smiles on seeing you awake. He has a long, deep scar across his cheek and a rough-looking face. Ah, oh, we didn't kill him after all. That's good. Nice try, says another, a younger man, in his teens, walking forward and crouching down. You should have known, shouldn't you? You should have recognized the workmanship. We're not playing around here. We're not new to this game. Then the third, a darkly dressed female, speaks up. Now, the only question that remains is, what do we do with you? The rough-looking older man speaks again. Moves gag. He orders the boy immediately obeys. You cough a little, sna smacking your lips to try and get a bit of moisture back into your parched mouth. Speak, the man says. Who are you? Uh, let's spin a yarn. No, I'm not good at spinning yarns. I'm very bad at spinning yarns. I'm not too bad. I'm kind of bad. Let's go with disclosure. You begin telling your story, the quest you are on for the Br Brumans, looking for their grandson, how you came to be here in Weathercut Wood, and everything that has happened so far. As you talk, you notice the three thieves, the older man, the young boy, and the woman, exchanging looks. The more you talk, the less they interrupt, and simply listen to your story. When you finally finish, there is a long silence. Finally, the older man, the one who seems like the leader of this little band of thieves, speaks. My friend, we had no idea. We blundered into the Death Knight's lair once before, seeking treasure. We had no idea what the place really was. We escaped there with our lives, barely. And untie me, you demand, and let me continue on my quest. The leader directs the boy to untie you, and he quickly does so. The leader motions the female thief to him and whispers something in her ear. She moves away quickly. As you massage your wrists and ankles, you are brought water to drink and some bread. The leader then crouches by your side, producing a map. You bite into the bread, surprised at how hungry you are. Here, he says, pointing to the small piece of parchment, the letter of the one you seek. Go to the tile page booklet and turn to the very back. You will see a hand-drawn map on the last page. This is what he's showing you. Woohoo! <coughs> um, crypt, temple, altar, blades, coffins. Uh, thanks for the warning. We went in there not long after we first arrived in Watercourt. The thief says quietly, we thought the place abandoned. No, this death knight you seek, he is in there. 
and probably keeping this boy Derek captive there too. As you can see, the map is incomplete. We were chased out there before we could progress further, but I'm sure his lair is just a little further on. I don't think the crypt went that far back. You pour over the map. And how do I get here? You ask, tapping the page. To the crypt. What is the entrance? The man exchanges looks with the other two, then turns back to you. If you are certain going there, I will give you the directions. It is north from here. You go past the junction and it is first left. The crypt is on the far side of the cemetery. But beware. I have a feeling that the Death Knight has become even more powerful since we last visited him. Go cautiously. Try to go unnoticed, like a shadow. Do it a little more and then thank the band of thieves. Recover two health points! They do not let you take any gold, but do gift you with one healing potion. Nice! Four healing potions. A blue colored tincture in an ornate bottle, which you accept gratefully. And. And the map which they also let you keep. Add these items to your inventory and leave this thieves den. Return to 8. Continue from the last direction. I guess we're going north. This goes to 11. Aha, the stream again. You know what? It's an hour and a half in. I think that's a good enough place to stop. For the, for the now. And I'll be back to this later. With Rina the Harbinger. Dumpy Ranger. Uh, okay, I have to go to sleep. If you plan on watching... Critical role like I do, you should probably go to sleep too. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Stay good. Have fun.